First John chapter 1, it says this in verse 5. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, say walk in the light. But if we walk in the light as he, meaning Jesus, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Let's pray and invite God's presence tonight into our hearts. God, we thank you for this word. God, we thank you that your word is alive, God. And we pray that tonight our hearts will be receptive to hearing all that you have for us. God, we thank you, Lord, that you love us. You have a plan and purpose for our lives. And God, I pray that the voice that we hear isn't a preacher's voice, but it's the Father's voice speaking to his kids. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to us a word that would really affirm who we are in you and give us practical handles in order for us to grow in our relationship with you. So Lord, we thank you for who you are. Bless this time. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Uh, the title of my message tonight is this. Uh, we is greater than me. We is greater than me. And I was thinking about activities in our lives. Uh, I was trying to think of activities that are fun just by yourself. And I really couldn't think of any activity that by yourself is really enjoyable and fun. I mean, there's a ton of different activities, but most of the things that we do in life is always better with other people. The only thing that I could actually think of that was actually sort of enjoyable by ourselves is like card games, like solitaire. That would kind of be like the only thing. Unless you guys can think of anything, you can talk to me after service. But I couldn't really think of m many activities that we do in life that are, are fun by ourselves. And, and so a lot of the things that I was thinking about um, really have to do about being with other people. Like you can play basketball by yourself, and that's fun. You can play and shoot hoops. But it's more fun if you're playing with other people. Have a game five on five, play horse with someone. You don't even need that many people. Just having someone else there makes it a more enjoyable time. Um, you can uh, play words with friends on your phone. And how many of us still play that? Like I know a few people still play with that. Um, the, you can play against the computer, and that can be fun, but it's more fun if you're actually playing against someone that you know Right, and you have that competition. Uh, many things in our life that we do are more enjoyable about, with other people. I was thinking about this. How, how many of us want to go to like Disneyland and Universal Studios? Like that's like the thing that you want to do. How many of you feel like, I mean, many of us think that Disneyland is the place to be. Uh, imagine going to Disneyland by yourself, okay? And I, you think that would, I mean, it's supposed to be the happiest place on earth. Um, you think you would enjoy Disneyland and all its fun by yourself. I mean, I think it would be enjoyable, but it would probably be more enjoyable if you're with other people. Like, imagine going on Splash Mountain, right? Okay? You're riding down Splash Mountain, and you go down the slide, right? And then as soon as the ride is done, the first thing that you do is you want to go see the picture, right? And so you go see the picture. The first person that you look at is you, how you look in the picture, and then you look at everyone else in the picture. If you were riding the Splash Mountain by yourself, it's fun, and you can look, hey, that was me making a smirk. But it's more fun to see other people's faces, your friends and different things. And so many things in life that we do, you can do it by yourself, but it's more enjoyable if you do it with other people. How many have ever gone to a movie by yourself? A few of us, okay. I'm not hating on doing things by yourself. I've actually uh, done this once in my life. So on my 25th birthday, I celebrated it in the Philippines, okay. And, I was, and when I celebrated my 25th birthday, I was kind of depressed at this time. And I normally don't like celebrating birthdays. And so at this time, I was kind of like... Um, really irritated with the people that I was doing life with. I was living in a house with 30 people. And so you just imagine that many people like in your space. Uh, and I, I kind of got a little frustrated. And so on my birthday, what I did is I woke up extra early and I was like, I'm going to do me today. I'm going to celebrate my birthday by myself. Okay. So what I did, I had breakfast at McDonald's by myself. Um, that was okay. You know, sitting with all the nanas and the tatas, you know, just kind of like, <laughs> It was cool. I was like the youngest guy there, and I was just like, all right, this is fun. Then I went and got a, a, a massage by myself. I was like, all right, you can, that's okay. Then I was like, I'm going to be adventurous. I'm going to watch a movie by myself. And I, watched, I went to the movie theater. I don't even remember what movie it was because I was just thinking the whole time I'm watching the movie, I'm watching a movie by myself. <laughs> this is weird. And you see everybody chirping in Tagalog, and I'm just like, ah, oh, this is not too good. And so progressively throughout the day, the, the day that started was supposed to be a fun day, started to be depressed because by the time dinner came, I was like, all right, I'm going to do something really good. My favorite restaurant is CPK. So they have a CPK in the Philippines. So I, I called a cab all the way to this city called Makati, and I went 
and to, to CPK to have dinner by myself. And so I went to the front desk. Um, the lady, the, the waitress, she was like, uh, how many in your party? I was like, oh, one. And she looked at me weird, like she was judging me in her Filipino eyes, right? <laughs> I was like, don't you judge me. And so, like, <laughs> she's leading me to the table, and I'm passing all the families, all the people, you know, celebrating dinner, eating dinner together. And then she puts me on, on a big table, like a big booth, <laughs> by myself. Okay, I'm sitting at CPK, my favorite restaurant, eating my favorite food by myself. And I just thought, this is okay, but this isn't really how God designed it to be. Like, there should be more to life. And I'm not hating on going to a movie by yourself. I'm not hating on doing activities by ourselves. But I realized one thing is this, that many of these activities are enjoyable, but they're more enjoyable when you're doing it with other people. And so similarly in our life spiritually, is like, even church... You can do church by yourself, but it's more enjoyable when you're doing church with other people. And the thing about spiritual walk is this, that there's, although we can enjoy church by ourselves, we can't grow in our relationship with God by ourselves. In your notes, it says this, that walking in lordship cannot be done alone. We are meant to walk together in community. God designs us and has designed us to do life together with one another. Our, our spiritual walk with him isn't just an isolated thing that we do just with him by ourselves, but it's always done in community. That verse that we read, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 and 7, it says this, but if we walk in the light, walking with God in the light as he is in the light, the immediate thing that happens after that, he says this, we have fellowship with one another. That word fellowship in the Greek is this word mean, that means koinonia. And this word is, there's a few different meanings that are part of this word, but it literally means this, intimacy and community. And so this one word is basically describing our relationship with God. It's saying, if you have koinonia with God, intimacy with God, immediately as you're walking in the light with him, you're going to have intimacy and community with other people. This is the two different things in our lives that as we're growing in our relationship with God, we do so in community. And as we have intimacy and community with God's people, we have intimacy with God. It's vice versa. It's these two things in our lives that help us grow in our relationship with him. It's not either or. It's a both and. See, our relationship with God is very personal, but it's never private. It's a personal relationship with God, but it's not a private thing that we just keep with ourselves and God. We enjoy God amongst God's people. And the reason why God is leading us in this direction and helping us to see that growing spiritually happens in community is because God in himself is a community. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. When God was creating the world, he didn't say, I'm going to create the world. He said, we're going to create the world. He said, let us create the world. And so God is saying that community is not something I'm telling you to do. Community is really a part of who I am as a person. That with, within me, within God, and this is a concept that we might not fully understand, but within God himself, there's a community there. It's a loving community of God loving the Son, Son loving the Father, Father loving the Spirit. And this union of love really permeates in relationships. And the thing I realize about this, our vertical relationship with God can really be seen in how well we do relationships with other people. Like if you're having fights and drama with different people in your life, that might be an indication of where you are spiritually in your relationship with God. Because our horizontal and our vertical relationships go hand in hand. And so if our horizontal relationships with one another is rocky, that might be an indication that our relationship with God is rocky. Case in point, last year was a very pivotal year for me in different sense. I got into a relationship um, with a girlfriend, my girlfriend. Uh, and at the same time, within a month's time, I got a roommate, Okay. And so community as I knew it, my life before this was just kind of doing me, doing whatever I wanted to do on my time and on my dollar, okay? I was just doing me. And then in a, a, about a week, four week span, my life as I knew it went from just thinking about me to having to think about other people. And I realized that through this, uh, it brought out a really a dark side of me that I didn't like because my personal space was a really invaded. I didn't have time to just get away and like get into a cave and just kind of isolate the world. How many of you like that? You need to go home and have your cave moment, like get away from the world. Um, how many of us are introverts? Like that's you. I'm an introvert. Okay, so I spend my days around people and I look forward to just going home, being by myself. 
And like not thinking anything. People ask me, like, what do you think about at home? Nothing. Like, that's what I do. I don't think about anything. Um, and so my life as a new was really ruined. And I realized that I was grouchy around people because I had these people in my life. And I was blaming them. Like, man, they're just invading my personal space. But what in reality what was revealed is that my personal time with God was actually lacking. And so what I was projecting onto them wasn't anything that was wrong with them. It revealed to me that I didn't really have my intimate time with God. And so if we're having a lack of intimacy in our lives with God personally, there's no wonder why our relationships don't work because we're bringing in our grouchy self into these relationships. But it's so easy to point the finger at other people and not realizing that there's so many other fingers pointed back at you that might be you're the reason why the relationships in our lives aren't working out too well. And so our relationship with God can really be seen in how we do interact with other people. So how is your relationships with other people right now? Do you find yourself uh, jumping from group to group, from drama to drama, blaming other people for their problems, your problems in your life? Or is it really a reflection on you not spending time with God? Because our relationship with Him is revealed in our relationships with other people. Second in your notes, it says this, community grows through connection, doing life together. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 10 in the New Living Translation says this, two people are better, than, better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. But if one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Is in real trouble. Um, discipleship happens in, uh, doesn't primarily happen in roles. It happens in circles. And here at Grace Bible Church Pro Side, what we call these circles is actually grace groups. And we really value grace groups because we created this environment of faith and a community of faith for you to experience your relationship with God amongst other people. And so grace groups is something that we talk about all the time because we really believe that God has called us to do life with other people. So we're going to create environments for you to actually experience God with other people. But I realize this, that many people and many of us here tonight, we just see church as a clock in and clock out. Like I'll just go on Sunday, do my thing do my time with God, and I'll leave. Like many of us, as soon as service is done, we don't even want to see people. We're like first on the shuttle, out the door, right? Because we just see church. We don't really understand the true value of church. We just kind of want to do it and get out of here. But church is so much more than that. Like it's so much more than just a word. It's really being in a relationship with other people. And the thing I love about our grace group, it's an authentic environment where it's okay. It's a safe place to not be okay. I think many times in our lives we think that when we come to church we got to be okay we have to have our act together and if you've done this long enough you can get into a place where you start to perform and do church things keep on the illusion like your life is really going well in reality in your heart your heart is in turmoil you're struggling with different things and there's a lust problem in your heart but because you want to give the illusion that you're good we get into this performance mindset and for us today I realized that the one things, there's so many things that impact our, our world as we see it, but many things have been shaping how we see our relationships. And the one thing that has been really shaping and redefining, redefining how we see relationships is social media. Because social media has really defined, redefined how we see the word friend. Uh, I'll give you some statistics. As of February 2014, the average amount of friends a person has on Facebook is uh, 649. 649 friends on Facebook. And we call it friends because it's just people that get thrown into this big category. And I even did another search and it says the average amount of contacts in a person's cell phone for a young adult, uh, for a teen is 600, and for a young adult is actually 400. So pop open your phone right now and see how many contacts that you have in your phone. Some of us have like hundreds and some of us had people in our phone that we don't even associate with like you were you went to like hula class when you were a kid and you got their number and you still keep it in your phone because it's a memory you know uh, but so we have a lot of people in our lives recent studies though show that the average person today has 2.03 close friends confidants in their lives I would hate for for you to be that zero three in a person's life I don't know how you quantify that but literally what it's saying that an average person has about two close friends that they consider confidants that they can really share their lives with two two friends and I was thinking about this if you were to get married today many of us would have to choose a bridal party or groomsmen who would actually be the people that you chose to be on your your groomsmen 
if you're a guy, or your bridesmaids if you're a girl. And if this is hard for you, it's an indication that you might not be developing the relationships, the intimate relationships, the real friendships that you need in your life that you should. I was talking with a guy today, oh, this week, and I was asking him, who are like the three closest people in your life? And it's a dude, and he basically listed his grandma, his mom, and his close girlfriend. I was like, is there any guys in your life? And he's, he stopped for a moment, and he said, no. So I was like, so if you got married today, who would be on your, like your groomsmen party? And he just stopped there for a second and couldn't think. And I realized today that we have a lot of friendships, but many of us have very few, like, close relationships. We're surrounded with doing life with people, but when it comes to, like, the real things in life, like, you might have 600 people in your phone, but when you're going through something rough in your life, do you have that one person that you can call at any time of the day to help you in that moment? Like, if you say no, then there's no wonder in our lives we're not really experiencing the fullness of how God created us to be and live in our relationship with him. If we don't have these intimate relationships in our lives, there's no wonder our relationship with God is hit a lid because there's only one way for us to break through these lids. is through having a relationship with other people. I realize this, that there's two big bar barriers for us to really developing intimacy with people in our lives, to having real relationships. Uh, the two, it's two eyes. One is insecurity and one is independence. Insecurity and independence really are two of the devil's biggest lies in our lives that keep us and prevent us from really connecting with other people in community or in fellowship. Insecurity says this. This is the two lies that you will hear in your mind. They don't need me and I don't fit in. These are the two lies that you will play in your, hair, your head when you're talking about getting connected to people in a grace group. The things that you might be, the lies that you might be listening to is they don't need me. No, nah, they're good. They're, they got their own thing. Like that's their clique. And I don't fit into that. And so I'm not going to get into that. Like, they don't need me. Uh, I don't fit in. And these are the lies that plague us. It's an insecure thing that we project on, onto other people. I realized that in my first grace group, um, I jumped into a group that was already established. Like, the people in this group had friendships for years. And a lot of the insecurities because of their friendship got revealed in me. Like, they were talking about things that they were doing in the past, the trips that they went on. And as you're sitting in these conversations and, and listening to people who had real friendships and talking about the things that they were doing, insecurity boils up in you and you kind of feel, like, left out. Like, oh, I'm not a part of this circle anymore. And the thing that I had to battle with is running from that circle, but actually forcing myself to stay in that circle because I knew in order for me to grow in my relationship with God, I needed to stay there. So I need to fight my my, my fear of insecurity or my fear of not fitting in in order for me to overcome this insecurity in my life. And I projected that onto them like, man, see, I don't fit in here. In reality, I can't get mad at them for establishing a relationship that was there before I even got in there. Like, they're not purposely trying to make me feel insecure, but being in a genuine community will surface insecurities in your life that God wants to deal with. And so that two big lies is uh, they don't need me and I don't fit in is stuff that we got to replaced with the truth of who God is in our lives. The second thing, independence. It says this, I don't need them. We live in a very independent culture where it's actually kind of a shame to think about doing things with other people. We actually pride and encourage people and actually pretty much promote people who actually can do things by themselves. If you can do this by yourself, you're going to get promoted. And we kind of celebrate this independent mindset. We celebrate like this Superman mentality where you can do it all by yourself. You don't need other people. And when it comes to spiritually, we take that mindset into our spiritual walk thinking that, I got this. I don't need anybody else. I've made it this far by myself. I don't need anyone else in my life. And so that independence mindset is something that needs to be broken. Brene Brown says this, one of the greatest barriers to connection is the cultural importance we place on going at it alone. Somehow we come to equate success with not just needing anyone, but doing it by ourselves. Many of us are willing to extend a helping hand but we're very reluctant to reach out for help when we need it ourselves. We're easy to give help to other people, but when we need it, we're very reluctant to receive it. It's as if we've divided the world into those who offer help and those who need help. The truth is that we are both. We both need to give help, 
but also we need to receive help. But if you are too independent thinking that you got it on your own, let me tell you, you're never ever going to make it in your spiritual walk with God. God is going to have to break you or come get you to a place of humility in order for you to really accept the fact that you can't do it by yourself, that you need other people. And I want to prevent you from going down that road right now. Don't Ha don't let God have to do that in your life. Don't let God have to humble you in order for you to really ex understand that you need other people. Like humble yourself now and put yourself intentionally amongst other people so that you can experience him in the community of other people. So instead of being insecure or independent, we need to be intentional about being in community. My question for us is this. Are we committed to cultivating community in our lives? Are we committed to doing this? Not just a temporary thing, but are we committed to doing this? There's a saying that says this, the grass is always greener on the other side. It's a, a saying that's just like, the grass is always greener on the other side. The truth is the grass is greener where you water it. Um, I have a, a small little yard in my house, my, my townhouse. I wouldn't even call it a yard. It's like more of a mini garden, okay? And in this garden, I have three plants. Uh, and two of the plants are directly outside of the roofing so when it rains like these plants get watered I have one plant that actually has flowers on it that is not a part of that like it's in the backside it's covered and so every single day I have to intentionally water that plant with a flower okay I don't necessarily have to intentionally water the other plants because I know that the rain will take care of itself but that one plant that's apart from the rain, I have to intentionally water that thing every day. There went for a month where I didn't water that thing, okay? I just was kind of forgot about it, and that plant literally died. And I could look at the other two plants, it's like, what's going on? Because they were getting natural water from the rain, I wasn't doing my part in taking care of that land, that, that one plant that wasn't getting watered. Same thing in our lives. We can look at other people and say, man, why are they having healthy relationships? Why are they doing things in their lives? We got to look at our own lives. Am I watering and intentionally watering the relationships that I want to have grow in my life? Don't get mad at other people for them having great relationships. Are you doing what you need to do to cultivate healthy relationships in your life? Are you being intentional about building re these relationships in your life? Because if you're not, you can't blame anyone else but yourself. Don't blame the church for the fact that you don't have relationships in the church because it's your responsibility. Like, we can provide an atmosphere for you to build relationships, but we're not going to build it for you. You have to build it yourself. Grace Groups is a place where you can join in a community, but you need to do your part to actually get connected to the Grace Group and actually build with the people in the group. It's not our responsibility uh, as a staff, but it's your responsibility as a disciple of God to own your relationship with God and own your relationships, period. And the thing about this is, this is where it comes to reality is that the truth is the enemy tries really hard to separate us from community. Tries really hard to separate us from community. The enemy understands the value that the community of faith brings. The enemy understands that in order for us to really grow in our relationship with God, we need to be intentionally in community. So what the enemy will do is do things to pull us intentionally away from the community so that we're isolated by ourselves. There's nothing wrong with being in isolation but you can't stay there for a long time. Isolation is good for reflection, for growing in your relationship with God, developing how to hear Him. But you don't stay there. You actually experience the relationship with God through other people. And so there's a positive side to isolation, but there's also a dark negative side to it. And we're going to see in this story in 2 Samuel 11, 1 to 5, it's talking about David. And let me tell you about David. David was a guy that was known as a man after God's own heart. He wrote tons of songs that really uh, praised God's name. He was actually known as like a person who had an intimate relationship with God. David was one of those guys who had an intimate relationship with God. And in this story that we're looking at, there was a time in his life where he was a king. He already conquered Goliath. He was doing major things in his life. But at this specific point in his life, what he started to do, he started to push the people that were closest to him away. Uh, he would send some of his close confidants to war. And all of these close people in his life started to be pushed away to the point where he was left in the castle or his kingdom by himself. And when he was by himself, he was actually vulnerable to an attack. And in this story, we look at uh, this is where David got tempted he saw Bathsheba taking a bath, how ironic that is. And he basically, in his mind, uh, gave in to his lust and he basically committed adultery. And then he hid that and tried to cover that thing up. The principle here in this story is that if he didn't push away these peoples in his life, the key relationships, he would have never got into that sin. 
But because he was isolated by himself, he pushed all these key people in his life away. What happened in his life, he was vulnerable to attack. Temptation came in and he gave in. But if he had his key men, his mighty men next to him, these people would not let him go into that, not make him do that stupid move, not let him be at the kingdom by himself. How many know when you're by yourself, you do some stupid stuff? You've ever done some dumb things that you wouldn't have done by yourself? I saw these videos online of what guys do by themselves and what girls do by themselves. And some stupid things like you start smelling things, you know. You didn't really, you know, it's, it's some random weird things. By ourselves, left to ourselves, we are not good by ourselves. We don't make smart decisions. Spiritually, it's the same thing. If you find yourself pushing other people away and going into isolation. You might be around people, but you start to slowly distance yourself from these key relationships. Be careful because temptation and your fall might be right around the corner. It might be right around the corner. I'm not saying that it will happen to you, but I'm saying that you're positioning yourself in your life to be vulnerable to an attack because you don't have these key relationships that guard you in your life. I'm so glad for the key relationships in my life. Help me do stu stop doing stupid things in my life, but Spiritually speaking, we need to have these relationships in our lives, not push them away. I think sometimes we start to isolate ourselves because there's a desire in our heart to want to sin, to want to give into temptation, and so we start to slowly step away from people, not go to groups so often, and kind of distance ourselves, not respond back to text messages and different things because in our heart, we're already wandering from God. We're already thinking about what we can do apart from Him, so we start to separate ourselves from His people so that we don't feel guilty about it. Because subconsciously we know that they're going to call us out on some things. And we avoid that. The Bible says this. In Proverbs 27, 5, it says this. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Because wounds from a friend can be trusted. But an enemy multiplies what? Kisses. Multiplies kisses. Hidden love is seeing something. But not saying something. And so if you really want healthy relationships in life. Keep that, keep that verse up. It says that we need to have friends in our lives that are, love us enough to wound us. Meaning that they'll, they'll, they love us so much that they'll speak the hard things into our lives and not be offended by that. That's what real love is. Sometimes we have just relationships with people that tell us the good things about us. What that verse says is that they're actually an enemy because they're just telling you what you want to hear. They're just kissing you. Now, I like that. Like, I, I like a friend that will just really encourage me. Did that come off weird? Like, I love seeing people kissing me. No, I love, I love being encouraged. Like, I love people telling me what I'm doing right, but I know that that in itself won't allow me to change. Because real change comes when a person loves me enough to tell me what I need to change. Tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. And that same principle applies to our lives. Look at your life right now. When was the last time someone actually challenged you or wound you in a loving way? And how did you respond to that? Did you embrace that, say, thank you for calling me out on that? Or did you stiff arm and say, like, what's wrong with you? Who do you think you talking about me? Let me tell you what you need to change. We get into this self-defense mode, and we start to push people away and not really embracing that in, my, in their lives. I thought about this. You know when Judas was about to betray Jesus? He went to Jesus, and what was the first thing that he did? He kissed Jesus before he actually betrayed him. This is a guy that was in Jesus' inner circle, and this verse came alive because what, instead of loving Jesus, what he did, he ended up wounding him seriously because he covered that with a kiss. How many of our relationships in our lives are like that? Where we just have people telling us what we want to hear, just kissing us in a negative sense because we know we want that, but if we really want to change, if we really want these things in our lives to be broken off, we need to have people to tell us the hard things, and we need to be that for other people as well. Like, if we expect that in our lives, we got to do that for other people. When was the last time you called out somebody on something that you saw, but you were too afraid because you didn't want to get them mad at you, so you're more afraid about them being mad at you than actually loving them. You're thinking more about yourself and about how God can use it to love them. There's this animal. Anyone heard about Chris the sheep before? It's this sheep that they found in New Zealand. Put the picture of Chris the sheep on. And it was a, a sheep that literally wandered away from the pack for five to six years, okay? He was with the, the flock of sheep, 
and he wandered away. And being that, that for five to six years, he accumulated that much wool in his life. There's so much wool on him that he was actually immovable. Like he couldn't do anything functioning. And it was so to the extreme point where the wool that he had on him was literally ripping off his skin. Like it was suffocating him to the point where he eventually, if he wasn't found, he would have actually died. And so what happened is uh, this overgrownness made his life miserable. So he got found and the people who found him was like, we got to do something about this. And so they, I didn't know that they had this, but Australia had a, has the greatest sheep shearer. He's like a champion, four-time champion sheep shearer. And what they did, this, they brought this guy in, okay? And they were like, we need your help to actually shear this sheep. And so they started, before they started cutting away the wool, what they did is they needed to put him under because they realized if they were just going to cut that away from him, he's going to flip out and actually might hurt himself in the process. So they drug Chris the sheep, put him to sleep, and that's when they started to cut away all of this wool. And so they brought in an expert. He started cutting away. The amount of wool that they cut away was 90 pounds. 90 pounds of wool was literally suffocating him alive, ripping at his skin. And in the process, uh, they were asking that expert shearer as he was cutting away that in the process, he nicked the, the, the sheep in the process. Chris got nicked in the process. And I, I thought so similarly to how we are compared to sheep by Jesus. And when we wander away from the pack, we start to accumulate a ton of junk in our lives. We start to pile up all these different issues in our lives because we're trying to do it by ourselves. We can't shear ourselves. We need other people in our lives to shear us for us. And so as we stay connected in community, that's where the shearing process happens. Chris got nicked in the process, but it was for his own good. And in relationships, let me break the news to you, you are going to get offended and have to deal with that in your life. There's no such thing as a perfect church. There's no such thing as a perfect grace group. There's no such thing as a perfect relationship. In the process, you're going to offend someone and they're going to offend you. That's just how relationships work. But are we going to run away from it and point fingers? Or are we going to deal with it and realizing that that conflict is an opportunity for us to grow in community but also to grow in intimacy with one another? Conflict can either make a relationship or it can break it. But if we realize that God has called us to be in community, we're going to embrace these conflicts in our lives. We're going to embrace these wounds because we know that it's for our own good. I realized this. I looked this up that sheep only have one self-defense mechanism. Only one. And that's being with other sheep. Being in a pack or a, I don't know what they call it. Being amongst other sheep. That's the only self-mechanism that they have. Self-defense mechanism. They don't have horns or rams or different things. They don't have like saliva that they can spit out at people to push people away. Their only self-defense mechanism is being among other sheep. And spiritually speaking, our only, our main, there's other main things, but our main way of us protecting ourselves from the enemy is being in community because the Bible says this, that the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. So he's looking for people who isolate themselves from the pack in order for him to attack them. But we're not going to be like that. We're going to do our part to intentionally stay in community. As we come to an end, the last point in the notes, it says this, only in community can we truly grow in God and fully walk in his will. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says this, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Spurring one another is that the thing on the back of a cowboy's boot that they would use to just like kick the, the horse basically spurring them in the direction. Similarly, that's what we got to do to one another. We need to encourage one another, spur one another on to growing in their relationship with God, getting in people's faces sometimes lovingly, challenging them in different areas of their life so that they can experience God's best for their lives. I want to bring up a guest spot tonight who really, her story really encaptions or captures the whole process of growing in community. So why don't, we help me, why don't you help me welcome Jaylen Lopez to the stage as she... He gets to share with us her story. So, Jalen, you've been coming to Grace Bible Church Pro Side for how long? Um, 
So what, three years? Three years? Yeah. And your journey was pretty interesting. Like, tell us about your life and your journey that you had before you came into your relationship with God. Um, so I was born and raised a Christian, but I didn't have a relationship with God. And so um, in high school, you know, I did the normal thing, drugs, alcohol, partying. Um, I went through relationships like water. I had a new boyfriend every month, pretty much. Um, and I was really looking for love, I guess, in just all the wrong places. And I didn't understand um, my purpose and what I wanted in life. And um, I kind of got into a homosexual relationship with a girl when I was um, a senior in high school. And this lasted four and a half years. And so um, during the relationship, I knew that it wasn't where I wanted to be or I just felt really lonely, but I had, I was with someone, you know, like I should have, I had friends I could talk to, but I came to a pivotal point of my life where it was just the end and I didn't understand it. Um, and one day I just, I just cried out to the Lord, you know, and I was just like, I heard God call me and just say, come to me, you know, and I just cried and I just, I said, God, you know, if this is not the life for me, then you need to make it known. Even before that, when you were younger, some traumatic things happened to you that kind of was the root that really, the domino effect of all of these things happened in your life. Tell us about that. Um, so when I was in elementary, um, I was actually abused um, by four different people. And I think I didn't know how to hold that. You know, and I think I covered it so much because it, I was ashamed. You know, and I never told anyone. And um, when... I started coming to Christ, um, God wanted me to share it. <laughs> that was the point where I was like, whoa, that's, I don't even know like exactly the full extent of that. Um, and it was really me coming to that end to be like um, getting a, a community because I know I needed it. But even your relationship with God, so God became real to you and you were trying to walk this thing out mm -hmm. and you realized that you were continuing to fail because you didn't have people that were helping you or guiding you along the way. So your beginning, I guess, years of grow, um, trying to grow in this relationship with God was pretty rocky because you were trying to do it by yourself. Tell us about that season in your life after you committed your heart to God. Okay, so um, when I finally broke up with um, my ex-girlfriend, um, I told God, like, okay, I'll dedicate my life to you. Um, and during that that year, I was pretty much alone. Um, I didn't, all my friends didn't know what I was going through. I couldn't talk to anybody about it. And um, I was trying to figure out how to walk this life with God. But at the same time, I was still doing, I was still partying, I was still dating people and like just fooling around. And there was no one to call me, like call me out, you know, and tell me like, hey, let me help you, you know? And so, um, what happened was I was going to church by myself and New Hope and then the roof caved in. And so I got invited by a friend to come to GBC. And um, when I came to GBC, I kind of was one of those people that kind of just was like, okay, in a church and I'm digging out as fast as I can, you know, don't talk to no one, don't make eye contact. Like that was the two things, let's go. And um, the moment that God really encountered me to get connected to someone was when someone pretty much walked up to me and was like, he kind of like, um, Matt Bolasan kind of stopped me and was like, hey, and he just kind of asked me questions, you know, like, um, how long have you been coming? Are you connected? And I was like, oh, not really. And I was like, I don't really think I want to be connected, but, you know, it was just um, getting out of myself. And I think um, he right away called over two girls and, um, my grace group leader that was a Jess before and Audrina. And so in that moment, I knew that God really wanted me to get connected and he was drawing me to his heart, you know, but I needed to be willing and open and transparent and raw with myself to be raw with others. So you get connected to this group and it was going fine, but then God started to prompt you in your heart to really be vulnerable. And the thing about being vulnerable and transparent is really like letting people know who you really are. Like, allowing them into your lives, not just the good things, but even the, some sort of the dark things in our lives. And God started to prompt you in your life to share and be open to that and to them about what, you happen, what happened to you in your life. And 
for anyone just to even talk about it. You never actually talked about it with anyone. And so that was like a fear that you were trying to battle. Like, why would I want to share this with them? But God started to lovingly nudge you in that direction. So tell us about what he was doing and what happened and how your life changed through just allowing yourselves to be vulnerable to other people. Um, so I guess what really helped me to be vulnerable was their, um, their openness first. You know, I went to group and I didn't write out, be like, hey, this is what happened to me. You know, like, but I was like, all right, I'm going to sit here and listen to their story, you know. And I kind of was just there to hear, like, their lives. And they were really open with me. Like, I had no idea who these girls were, but they were talking about things that they were dealing with and, like, you know, deep stuff like family things things of their past um and i was just like whoa you know <laughs> like um okay and then i started to grow a relationship with them and getting closer and it gave me an ability to start being open um and start telling them things like small things first you know um oh what's going on in my life you know and then god kind of was like are you are you ready to share with them your abuse you know um, and I've never told anyone that. And I think I was going through, I was still going through shame and fear and like, what are these people going to think of me? You know, like, I don't even understand it. But um, God was like, are you ready to be open? You know, like, and in that point, I think with them being open with me, it allowed me to be like, okay, you know, like, let's, let's just do it. Um, so I did, I ended up telling them one night and they just loved me. It was just an overwhelming sensation of God's love, but they loved me with the truth, and that was what it was. It was they loved me, and they told me like, that's not who God made me to be, and that's not, like, God has healing for me, but they directed me. And after that, they were like, you know, like, um, they suggested things, like, oh, you know, we know some people that have been to that. And if you want, we can help you. We can, t like, lead you to them. And they walked with me through the whole entire thing. Um, and I had an encounter with God um, one day, and it was really God. He took me to a scripture, and the scripture basically said to seek counsel. And so it was, like, outside counsel, you know, and, like, going to counseling. And I was like, oh, my God, I don't want to go to counseling. <laughs> like, I was still ashamed, you know, I didn't want to go through counseling, I think also I was so prideful, you know, like, and in that moment, um, you know, like, they helped me walk through that pride and helped me to be like, you know, it's not shameful to seek counsel. And because of that, I decided to do that. And so I did, I, I did it in 2013, I walked through counseling, um, I think Catholic Charities, mm -hmm. and um, for about six to eight months, and it, it was amazing, you know, like, after, like, God fully set me free from, you know, all that pain and the abuse and the shame and even the fear of, of, like, being so raw and open with people to, like, just lay it all and not know what they're going to think of you, mm. you know, not even know what they're going to say to you. And it's, like, I think that was my p pivotal point, you know, to really be connected. And so for you being connected was allowed you to be transparent, allowed you to really walk in the light. And really what walking in the light means that any area of darkness in your life is just basically allowing others into that moment. That's what walking in the light means. It's not keeping things hidden to yourself, but really being vulnerable enough to share that with other people. And as we walk in the light, as Christ is in the light, that, the fellowship, that intimacy with other people became a reality for you. And then you started to realize that they were helping you grow in your relationship with God. And then the breakthroughs that you needed in your life started to happen as you started to really get deeper in a community of other people. Now you lead your own grace group, and now you're helping other people grow in their relationship with God. And so this has kind of come full circle for you, and it's been a journey. It didn't happen overnight. Relationships don't happen overnight, okay? It takes time. It takes int intentional effort. It takes consistency. But for you, being in that environment, growing there, and allowing God to work in you, now he's working through you, and you're bringing healing and, and break through other people's lives. So I know a lot of people are here are on the fence about community, maybe have been burned in the past or different things. How could you encourage them with your story about how powerful it is to be in fellowship with other people? Um, so if you're struggling with that, you know, I just, it's hard to be open to people. It is because you're taking a risk, 
you know, to really um, lay everything down and you're really sitting in a position of humility. Um, and, you know, like, I would just really encourage you to, like, even if it's, you don't even have to do, like, a whole setting of people. You know, you could actually just pick out one person to really be open to and just let that person help you and pour out to, you know, like, because um, we really can't do this alone. Like, if it wasn't for my leaders and my girls, and they also, like, praying for me, you know, because everything starts with prayer as well. So, like, if it wasn't for them praying for me and continuing to, like, love me and pour into me, then I wouldn't understand what community really looked like and why we need it so much. You know, like, um, we get into this mind mentality sometimes, I think, of, like, what we were, what Kalai was saying, like, you know, we're so used to doing it ourselves. And it's so easy to do it ourselves because we get things done, you know, like, or we can just go, we don't have to rely on other people. But really, in a relationship with people, you carry each other. Mm. And I think, like, um, we can't hold these things alone, you know, on ourselves. And we need to help other people as well as we need to let other people carry us. How about I have for Jalen and her story? <laughs> and as the worship team comes up, this will kind of come to an end. You know, if you ever bought shoes online, I do it all the time. You ever bought shoes from Nike and it comes in and then you try on the shoes and you realize it doesn't fit? Whose fault is it? Is it Nike's fault or is it your fault? Some people say Nike. Some people say our fault. Here's the truth. It's neither's fault. No one's fault. It just wasn't a fit. And sometimes we come to church, we've tried church for a while, and we didn't find our fit there, and we just kind of say, okay, church, is, I'm not, church isn't for me. Maybe you've even tried Grace Group. You went to a group, and you tried it out, and you think, ah, just didn't fit. It's not the Grace Group's fault. It's not your fault. It just wasn't a fit. But don't keep stopping in the process and just eliminating that altogether, saying that there's no value to that, because there is value to that. Keep seeking until you find a match, something that fits. Keep looking for those relationships. Maybe you tried a relationship before getting into a community and it didn't work out. Don't say community is wrong, but keep looking for a fit because God has a fit for you and I. Maybe you tried a group before and maybe it's an opportunity for you to try another group. Maybe even Grace Bible Church Pro Side isn't your church, but don't negate church altogether. Maybe there's another church out there for you because all of us need community and we just got to find the right fit in our lives. This whole thing about us being vulnerable, that, that word vulnerable, the Greek word comes from this word called vulnera, which basically means to allow yourself to be wounded. That's what vulnerable means. To open your life enough to be so vulnerable that you allow yourself to be wounded. You know Christ modeled that for us on the cross. Like on the cross, that was probably the most vulnerable place for him. Hanging there beaten and bruised in a shameful yet a, and a humble place in his life saying that if I'm calling you to be vulnerable I'm going to model that myself he was wounded on our behalf he made himself vulnerable so that we can be vulnerable in him so when Jesus is talking about transparency and opening our lives it's not something that he hasn't done before in his own life he actually took the first step and he's inviting us and calling us to take these practical steps to be vulnerable with other people. Your breakthrough might not be, you might not experience the breakthrough that you need because you haven't necessarily brought these things to light. Being vulnerable, I wanna encourage you tonight to trust God, to allow his community that he's gonna place you in to be a place for you to experience his power as we are vulnerable, vulnerable for him. Let's pray. God, I thank you. For your power i thank you for your love i thank you for this community god there's no such thing as the perfect community but would you still use imperfect things for your perfect good in our lives and god i know that there's people here all different places in their lives that have been battling different lies different independence mindsets or even an insecurity mindset god that's kind of preventing them from really connecting and Lord, I pray that tonight, Lord, we'll take the practical step to first allow you into our hearts, but Lord, 
to move in faith, to overcome these fears, they really get connected to experience what it's like to be fully known by another person. And so, Lord, I pray that you begin to reveal our hearts, God, begin to break some of these lies in our hearts that prevent us from experiencing you. And tonight, Lord, we will begin to take practical steps to develop healthy, loving community and fellowship in our lives. So, Lord, we trust you in this.